I'll be recording. When we are done, I'll put the video on my YouTube channel so that those who may miss part of the class or will not be able to make it to class can download the video and watch later. So I want us to start because we are doing two main things and uh, I, I need us to finish very early because I have a lot of things to do. Um, this month, I trust in the almighty Lord that you are all feeling, I mean, fine by his grace this morning. Is that correct? Are you all well by his grace? Yes, madam, please. Okay, so we thank God for that. So um, this morning... I mean, I want to take those away from, oh, I want to take, that it doesn't block your view. Okay, so this morning we are going to be looking at two main things. The first one, we will consider electronic commerce technologies. And then the second part of the lecture will be about security of electronic transactions. Now, uh, next week we'll meet in person. That is all things being equal. We'll meet in person. I don't know. You can never predict what will happen. But should anything come up, I'll let you know. But in my plans, as of now, we'll meet in person. All right. So let's begin with Electronic commerce technology. Oh, we, we have it, we have a lot. So technologies. Now, another name, another name for electronic commerce technologies is electronic commerce topologies. Electronic commerce topologies. So in exams, if you don't see electronic commerce technologies, but then you see electronic commerce topologies. They are all the same. They all refer to the same thing. Okay, so um, with the electronic commerce technologies, you remember we looked at e-banking technologies and under e-banking technologies, we saw a lot of technologies. That is, we saw so many things that come together to give us the electronic commerce. I told you that as soon as you join, you mute yourself so that we don't get feedbacks from your background. Okay, so with electronic banking technologies, we saw we have so many technologies that come together to give us e-banking technologies or digital banking technologies. The story is not different um, with electronic commerce or um, um, uh, e-business. With e-business or electronic commerce too, we have so many technologies. In fact, all the technologies we saw under e-banking fall under this one too, because we realized that, you see, if you go through the notes I sent to you on e-business, E-banking is an aspect of e-business. So since e-banking is an aspect of e-business, then it means that if you are looking at electronic business or electronic commerce technologies, then it means that we are referring to all the technologies we saw under e-banking, as well as some technologies we'll see under uh, electronic commerce technologies. Now, even though I have made mention of the fact that electronic commerce technologies involve all the techno, so many technologies, including those technologies we saw under electronic banking. When we talk about electronic commerce or electronic business technologies, basically we are looking at, or we are referring to three main technologies, three main technologies. Now, these three main technologies, they help, or you can say three types of communication networks. They help with electronic 
e-commerce transactions or business transactions. Now, these three technologies I'm referring to this morning are the internet, the intranet, and the extranet. The internet, the intranet, and the extranet. So you see that one is inter, the second is intra, and the third is extra. Then you add net, the nets. So internet, intranet, and extranet. These are the three main technologies or topologies of electronic commerce that we are going to be looking at this morning. So whenever, whenever you are asked to talk about electronic commerce technologies or electronic commerce topologies, these are the three main technologies you will talk about. Do not go and make mention of any other technology except for these three. Like I mentioned before, we acknowledge that all the technologies we saw under e-commerce also fall in here. But basically speaking, when we are talking about electronic commerce technologies, we mean these three. So please take notice of that. So that when you meet this in exams, you will not go and produce answers which are not supposed to be produced. Okay, so, so we will take a look at them one after the other. That is, we are going to look at all those technologies, the three technologies. We'll take them one after the other, then we'll look at how they work. Now, we begin with the internet technology, the internet technology. Now, with the internet technology, we know that the internet has come to make communication very, very, very easy. The internet has facilitated communication between ourselves and the outside world. You can communicate with people in your organization, outside your organization, within your country, outside your country. I mean, irrespective of wherever the person finds himself or herself, you can have you know, productive communication with that person with the aid of the internet. It used to be before the internet was born that if you needed to communicate, with people outside your country or outside your business uh, organization, you had to resort to either the internet, which worked with uh, computerized systems like EDI, uh, sorry, EDI is rather extranet. You had to resort to um, technologies at that time like fax, fax mail, et cetera, et cetera. But now with the internet in place, communication has become very, very, very easy for us. Now, it is important that we know and appreciate how the internet, which has helped or which has facilitated communication among people, it is important we know how the internet works. And knowing how the internet works helps you to understand and appreciate how in the internet has come to help with electronic commerce or electronic stroke digital banking. Now, if you look at human beings, I mean, as I speak to you now, if you happen not to understand the English language, there's no way you will understand all the things I've been saying for the past like 10 minutes now. If you don't understand English, you will not understand the language I am speaking. So you see, as humans as we are, we need to understand each other before a meaningful communication will be, will, will be said to have taken place. If you want to communicate with somebody, one of the key things that you need to acknowledge 
or realize is the fact that the person you are going to communicate with understands the language you are using for the communication. Because in communication, one of the key things is understanding. That is getting the understanding of the people to whom the message is intended for. So if you communicate with somebody, the language that you are using for the communication is not a language that the people you are communicating with understand, then it means you have not done anything. No communication would be said to have taken place. And the story is not different for computers. The story is not different for computers. Just like human beings, we need to understand each other or we need to speak in a common language before we can understand each other. Computers also can only communicate with each other when they all speak a common language. So for computers to be able to understand each other, that is for me to send a message from my end to a recipient at the other end, for the recipient to receive the message, the message just as I intended it, that person should be able to, or the two computers, my computer or my system, and that person's computer or the person's system should be able to speak in a common language. And this common language, which helps with communication among computers, or which is how the internet operates or works, is what we call the communication protocol. Communication protocol. So computers actually understand each other when they all speak in a common language called protocol. Protocol. Now, the big question, I told you that we are looking at how the internet works. So the first thing you need to know is the internet operates with protocols. So if there are no protocols, the internet cannot operate. That is why if you remember, if you read the, or if you have listened to the um, lecture notes on electronic commerce that I sent to you, I made mention of the fact that um, when it comes to, uh, uh, um, you see, what I was going to say has even escaped me. When it comes to um, my people, what was I saying? You see, as I'm speaking to you now, I've not slept the entire night, so my mind is not stable. What was I talking about? Remind me. Let me see if you're also following the lecture. What was I talking about? And you said if there are no protocols, the computer cannot communicate interchangeably. Exactly, that's very good. So that reminds me to what I was saying. I was saying that in the uh, lecture notes I sent to you on electronic, uh, is it, um, um, the last lecture note was what? Electronic commerce, right? Yeah, electronic commerce. I made mention of the fact that when, when the internet, even before the internet was born, we were using all uh, EDI, that is electronic data interchange was facilitating online transactions, et cetera, et cetera. So we had online transactions, but there was nothing like the internet. The internet was born when um, Tim Berners-Lee wrote a paper on the internet that is www in 1989 and it, that paper was eventually accepted for use in 1990 so the internet was born in 1990 but when the internet was born it took four to five years before it could fully function because it took four to five years for computer protocols to be developed so it was around 1994 that the, comp the internet started operating so you, 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 you will notice from this that without protocols or communication protocols, the computer or the, sorry, the internet cannot function. The internet cannot function. All right. So now that we have seen what the communication protocol is, 
that is, I mean, we have we have seen that the internet cannot function without the communication protocols. Let's go into communication protocols and look at some examples of communication protocols and how one of the main examples that we are going to look at in this class operates. So what is a computer or communication protocol? Now, when we talk about communication protocol, we are just looking at a protocol, the format for exchanging data. A protocol is a format for exchanging data. That is why we said earlier, or I made mention earlier that without the protocol, the internet cannot function because the internet functioning means exchanging of data from one person to another person or from one computer to another computer. So the, inter the protocols define or gives us the format for exchanging of data. Now, these protocols are themselves the settings for computers connected to the internet. They are the settings for computers connected to the internet. So you see that without the protocols, there's no way the internet can function. And these protocols also determine the speed. They determine the speed of data transfer and the way even data is packaged. So without protocols, that we, there will be no speed and the data will not be packaged in such a way that it will move from the sending computer or the sender's computer to the recipient's computer. Now, all the computers that we know of, which are connected to the internet, they all use the same protocol because if they don't use the same protocol, there's no way there can be an exchange of data among them. So they all speak in the same language, which happens to be the communication protocol. Now, there are so many types of protocols. There are so many types of protocols. We have examples include the TCP stroke IP protocols, we have the TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol. Then the IP stands for Internet Protocol. Then we have the second example of protocol. We have FTP. The FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol. File Transfer Protocol. Then we have the HTTP. The HTTP, those of us who use the internet a lot, you know that when you go to the URL section, you need the HTTP before you can type in whatever address that you want to visit on the internet. So the HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And we have the SHTTP, which stands for Secure Hypertext Transfer Protocol, Secure Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Then we have the Telnet. What the Telnet does is it allows for remote access we have the Ethernet, and this Ethernet is actually a system for connecting a number of computer systems to form what we call a local area network. And this local net, uh, area network operates with protocols to control the passing of information from one computer to another and to avoid simultaneous transmission by two or more systems. Now, you know that at every point in time, now, just like we are doing, now what we are doing, we are on the internet. We are using the internet to facilitate communication. The same way so many people from all over the world are using the internet. So imagine if there's no internet to help with, you know, to help with simultaneous transmission in order not for uh, messages to cross each other, and there was going to be chaos. So this Ethernet helps or operates with protocols to control the passing of information so that there will be, uh, we will avoid the simultaneous, you know, or uh, the crossing of messages from people who happen to be online communicating with each other. So these are some of the types of protocols that we have. And in this class, 
we will only look at one of them, which is a TCP stroke IP. That is what is meant for this class. The rest, you can read on them on your own for your own general knowledge sake. But this class, if you'll be examined, you'll be examined on only TCP stroke IP. The rest are for your own knowledge. So now let's move on to looking at the TCP stroke IP, TCP stroke IP protocol. Now, the TCP stroke IP, we have two main protocols combined as one, two main protocols. So the TCP stroke IP has two parts. The first part is the TCP part. Then the second part is the IP part. So what the first part? The TCP, I told you, the TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol. Excuse me, and before because I've not slept the whole night, so I'm I'm I'm, I'm having nasal congestion and all that, but I'm managing. It is not easy. Okay, so. The TCP is one part, IP is another part. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol, and then the IP stands for Internet Protocol. Now the TCP part of the TCP stroke IP protocol handles what we call the data transportation. The TCP part handles data transportation, whilst the IP part performs what we call the routing and traceability or addressing, routing and addressing. Now, let's look at them or let's take them as in the TCP part, which handles data transportation. Let's look at what data transportation is. Then we'll come and look at IP part, which also takes care of routing and addressing. Then we'll look at what routing is and what addressing also is. Now we begin with data transportation or data transport. And I have made mention of the fact that the TCP part is in charge of data transportation. You understand what transportation is. That is a means of traveling or a means of moving from one point to another point. So get this at the back of your mind because when I'm done, I'll give when I'm done explaining the three, I'll give you a scenario of how or why we, 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 we talk about data transportation or we talk about routing, addressing. I'll use a simple scenario to illustrate how it operates in, in real life. Now, with data transport, there are two main methods for transporting data across a network. There are two main methods of transporting data across a network. We have the first method, which is known as the circuits, the circuit method. And one thing you need to know about the circuit method is that circuit method of switching, another name for the uh, circuit method is circuit switching. Circuit method of switching is commonly used for data, sorry, voice transportation, voice transportation. So you will see that the circuit switching system is what the telecommunication uh, companies, that is what they use, especially with telephone calls. With telephone calls, if you pick up a phone and you place a, a call to another person uh, somewhere else, the transportation system, how your voice is carried from your end to the other person's end is by the help of the circuit switching. So circuit is commonly used for voice transportation. And the second method is packet switching, packet switching. And the packet switching is also used for data transportation, data transportation. So when you send an email from your computer to another computer, it is this, the packet switching which takes charge of transporting that message from your computer or from your mail to the recipient mail. So that is the data transportation system. There are two main methods. I told you that the circuit switching is for voice transport. Then the packet switching is for 
uh, data transport. Now, actually, when you type a message from your computer to another person's computer or the recipient's computer, the message, for instance, if you type, um, um, I need you to go to the market and buy me some oranges tomorrow. If you are sending this message, I need you to go to the market and buy me some oranges tomorrow. If you are sending this message from your computer to uh, the recipient's computer, what happens is that the message is not transported as you send it, as this long sentence that you type. The message, the message is broken down into smaller pieces called the packets. The message is broken down into smaller pieces called the packet. And this packet, you know, sends the message determining the path, you know, uh, uh, sends the message in a sequence, in, in a sequence such that when it will get to the recipient's computer as intended. Now, if in your spare time, I, I used to have videos of this, but um, because I'm not teaching in person, so I normally don't show them. But then in your spare time, if you go to the, if you go to YouTube, you can uh, search for videos on packet switching. You know, the internet is a packet switching network. So you can search for a video on packet switching. They, they will use some form of cartoons to illustrate to you how the packet switching works. Now, so the, the message is broken down into packets, and this packet determines the, sequ the sequence, the correct sequence with which the message should be transported such that it will get to the recipient's computer just as it was intended. So that is the data transportation. So when you type in a message from your computer to another person's computer, the message, what, what you need to know is that the message is broken down into smaller packets and the packets are transported to the recipient's uh, computer. And the packet ensures that the recipient gets the message in the exact sequence uh, it was sent. All right, so now that is TCP part of the TCP stroke IP protocol. I told you the TCP part handles data transportation. Now let's come to the IP part. The IP part I, I made known to you is in charge of two main things. That is the routing and then the um, addressing. Now with the routing, when we talk about routing, we are simply referring to the process of determining the path with which a message should take from the sender's computer to the recipient's computer. The path with which message should take from the sender's computer to the recipient's computer. So the IP part of the TCP stroke IP protocol, which is in charge of routing, actually determines the path with which the message that you are sending. So when you sit by your computer and then you send an email to somebody, once you type the email and you click send, it is the duty of this routing. You see the uh, TCP data transportation takes care of the transportation system as a whole. Then the routing is in charge of determining the path with which the message should take in order to reach its destination. So routing is actually uh, an important part of the IP Without, without which the message cannot be transported. Because without a correct path, how do you transport? If you decide to travel to Kumase and th th there's no route from here to Kumase, how do you get to Kumase? There's no way you can get to Kumase. You need a path for a vehicle to drive on or for an aeroplane to take or for a train to take before you can get to your final destination. So that is how the routing works. So the routing is in charge of determining the path with which the message should take before it can reaches, uh, sorry, before it reaches the 
recipient computer. Then we have the addressability, the addressability. And the addressability or the addressing is the second function of the IP part of CP, a TCP stroke IP protocol. Now with addressing, you know that without address, your message cannot be sent from your computer to the recipient's computer. If you are sending an email, just you can try this. You sometimes, those of you who have been experiencing it, sometimes when you are sending an email, or it can even be a test message, when you are sending a test message and you have not indicated the address or the telephone number of the person the message is intended for, when you click send, you have a feedback that you need to put in the address. If there's no address, there's no way the message can get to the recipient. So addressing is a very, very important part of the IP protocol, without which the message cannot be transported. Now, when we talk about addressing or the uh, internet addressing system, now I have already made known to you that the IP, which is the internet protocol, is in charge of routing and addressing. When we talk about IP address, um, which I'm sure uh, almost all of you have heard of it before, IP address. An IP address is actually what we describe as a 32, a unique 32 bit number, which consists of four groups of decimal numbers. And the four group of decimal numbers normally ranges from zero to 255. Now, if you look at the internet addressing system, it is normally in numbers. IP addresses are normally in numbers. In fact, the computer or the internet only recognizes IP numbers, IP addresses in numbers, not in words. IP numbers in IP addresses in numbers, but not in words. When I talk about IP address, I'm talking about the websites or uh, uh, the, uh, how do you call it? Yeah, the web page address, or it can also mean your email address or whatever, just name them. But let's limit ourselves to the website addressing system. For instance, I just made mention of the fact that the internet only recognizes IP address in numerics. It doesn't recognize IP address in letters. But here is the case. You know that as humans as we are, we, we, it is difficult committing numbers, so many numbers in our head, unlike how we are able to commit letters in our head. When people can do chew and pour the whole book. They can chew everything because it is in letters. But if it were to be in numbers, chewing the whole book becomes very difficult. But be, so because of this difficulty, instead of IP address being in numerics, which the computer only reads, IP address system for the sake of human beings recognizing and committing them in their heads are normally, give, are normally given in letter form, are normally given in letter form. For instance, if you look at our university's website address, we have um, upsa.edu.gh. That is www.upsa.edu.gh. This address is in letter form. It is in, in letter form. But I just mentioned some few seconds ago that the internet only reads numeric. And human beings can also commit better letter, letters in their head. So we have addresses in letter form. So what happens? How does the internet read? When I type at the URL section of my page, my web page, if I type www.upsa.edu.gh, then this, this address in letter form 
should be in numerics before the computer will be able to understand and read and then get you to that particular web page that that's UPS's website that you want to visit. So what happens? Now, there is this system. There is this system called a, the domain name server, DNS. Some also say domain name system. So the domain name server, shortened as D, uh, DNS, is actually in charge of converting IP address in letter form to numerics to enable the internet to understand and get the person or the user to the particular website the person is trying to access. So as soon as you type in your IP address, www.upsa.com, edu.gh, then the DNS takes hold of this letter form address and then changes or converts it to numerics. So you see these numerics, which ranges from all these 42 big unique numbers, which ranges from zero to 255 that we mentioned some few seconds ago, you see the numeric form of www.upsa.edu.gh uh, uh, in numerics like, for instance, 128.192.73.60. There is always a last dot. When we key in the address in letter form, we don't bring a dot. But when the DNS converts it to numerics, there's always a last dot because this dot is going to actually determine the route. This is what is directing where the path or where the, uh, the, the, the system should go to. So that is how the IP address system operates. DNS is very key when it comes to the IP address system. Okay. Now, so we have seen that the TCP stroke IP. I told you that the TCP handles the data transportation, IP handles the routing and addressing. Now, let me illustrate with our transport system. For instance, I just want to illustrate for you to see how the TCP stroke IP operates. Uh, in the to facilitate the internet to you know work if you decide to go to Accra central from upsa campus right let's say you want to go and buy some things at Accra central you are at upsa campus you know that before you get to Accra Okay, uh, I think we went off a bit. Hmm. The internet has started fooling again. I'm just praying we'll finish before it, it, it begins its uh, you know, usual thing. So if you decide to go to Accra Central to get some things, the first thing you need to determine is, I mean, you, you need to know where you are going to, right? which is your address. You need to know where you are going to. And in this scenario, where you are going to is Accra Central. But Accra Central is your final destination, which is your address. Now, after you know where you are going to, the first okay, thing that you need is, to also need determine. After you know your destination, the next thing you need to determine is how you will get to Accra Central. How do you get to Accra Central? That brings in the transportation system. The transportation system. Now, the transportation system 
Why is it that when you are there, then you just unmute yourself and your background noises will be disturbing the class? Please, mute your microphones. Do not unmute. Nobody is interested in whatever is going on at your end. What you are interested in is the lecture we are having. So nobody should unmute his or her microphone. The only time you can unmute your microphone is when I get to question and answer section. Gifty, every year, mute your microphone. Now, what I'm going to do is, anybody who unmutes his microphone, I'll take you off. And when you want to come back, I will not allow you. You have been using uh, uh, Zoom for two years now. So the, some of these instructions, we shouldn't be telling you. You should know better. You know how I get this step when I get feedbacks from your backgrounds. Okay. So as I was saying, now, if you are going to Accra Central and you know that Accra Central is your final destination, so that is your address. So that represents the addressing part of the IP, part of CP, TCP stroke IP protocol. So you have your address, which is the Accra Central. Now you have to determine your transportation system. Your transportation system, whether you are going by taxi or you are going by um, um, Petro or you are going by bus or whatever, or your private car. So that transportation system, let's say you are going by your private car, right? So you'll be your own driver. So your car will serve as your transportation system. And that will represent the TC part of the TCP stroke IP protocol. So now we have our address. We have our, our um, transport system. Now, how do we get to Accra Central? How do we get to Accra Central, which is the final destination of the person going to Accra Central? Now, how to get to Accra Central is dependent on the driver, the person who is going to drive the vehicle, because that person is going to determine the route with which he or she should take to move from UPSA and then get to Accra Central. Okay, and then get to Accra Central. All right, now, so if, for instance, I am the driver of, the, of my own personal vehicle, then I'm going to determine from UPSA to Accra Central, there are so many routes, at, at least from UPSA campus, we can have three routes. The first route is that we can turn, when we move out of UPSA campus, we can turn right. And go straight. When we hit the uh, uh, business school, they go on business school junction, that's the uh, golf filling station junction, then we can just take left and join the main road to Accra Central. That is one route. Or when we turn left from UPSA campus, we can go through the Trinity Road. Trinity Road, Baoleishi. If you want to get to Baoleishi, the option of taking either the Oponglo Road to join the main road or taking the Lagos Avenue Road to join the main road. You see, so many routes. So I will have to decide. Uh, when we move from UPSA campus, the third route is that we can take left. When we take left, we can drive straight to, I mean, there are so many, you can drive when you get to, um, what's place? Um, is it, is it, um, um, oh, this food joint, this popular food joint. When you on your way, when you turn left, just some few minutes drive from our campus, some few seconds in Punya minutes. Oh, uh, is it Red Lobsters? Red Lobsters. They used to be behind UPSC or something. Red Lobsters. There's a route there that you can use some long, long routes. You can use that route to hit to uh, this place. Um. Um. You know the, uh, oh, second paint before uh, the standard box area. When you are moving from Lagos Avenue, where you hit, you see there's, there's an access route. If you use the route I'm talking about, you come and join the lane over there. Or when you turn left, you can decide to go straight. Get to American House, 
when you get to American House, you have two options. You can take Baoleishi Road. Even when you get to a champion, you have further two options. You can take the, uh, uh, the champion road, that is the left road, or you can go straight to use the Baoleishi. Or when you get to American House, you can decide to use the flower pot. That's the under bridge area to hit the Tashi. You see, there are so many routes. But it is up to me, the driver, to determine which route will suit me, which route will get me faster to a car center. I hope you are following. So that is what the routing is in charge of, routing. Now, the routing will have to decide the path with which. So the routing is now the driver. The routing decide the path with which the vehicle, which is a transportation system, Move, moves from the center's end to the recipient's final destination. So that is how I can illustrate the TCP stroke IP, how it works with our practical, um, um, I mean, everyday thing that we do. Okay, now the internet that we have talked about has what we call a, a global assets. You see, the internet has a global asset. Once you're online, or you go online, you can reach people from so many parts of the world. So many computers are connected uh, to give us the internet. So when you are here and you want to, that is in Ghana, you want to communicate with somebody in India, Indonesia, in Switzerland, in uh, um, 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 Finland, in, 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 uh, in, in uh, Iran, in Dubai, in wherever, US, UK, South Africa, Uganda, name them. The internet makes it possible for that to happen. That is what we mean by the internet is a global network of networks. It gives a global access to all people. Okay, so that is the internet. Now let's move on to the second topology or technology, which is the intranet, the intranet. Now with the intranet, many organizations, or the first thing you need to know about the intranet is that it facilitates communication, I mean, internal communication within the organization. The intranet facilitates internal communication within the organization. With intranets, if you are not part of the organization, there is no way you can have access to the organization's intranet. The intranet is used for internal communication. And that is the only thing the intranet is used for. The intranet does not have a global access, no. The intranet is limited to some defined group of people who work in a particular institution, organization, etc. So before you can use the int int intranet, you need to be a part of that particular group, or organization, or association, or institution. Now, if you go to most of our, whether public or private institutions, it can be companies or whatever, if you go there, you know, normally they have this um, uh, kind of system which allows, for instance, if the boss wants to send uh, a message to his subordinates or the subordinates to perform a particular task, the boss, all the boss will have to do is to go onto his computer and then send a message. This message will be sent to the subordinate. The subordinates will get an alert that the boss has sent a message. Then he will respond accordingly. This kind of system is what we call the internet. If you are not within the organization, you cannot have access. Even if you are a part of the people who have been defined to have access to this particular system, once you move outside the organization, you cannot access the internet. It works within the organization. That is why we say that it facilitates internal communication within the organization. It is an intra intra-organizational network, intra. So it actually enables people within the organization to communicate and cooperate with each other. 
That is the intranet. Normally, what happens is that normally, or how we, we get the intranet is that the uh, firewall, we we'll, we'll look at firewall very soon. Firewall is normally used to restrict access of our, our people outside the organization to access the organization's uh, you know, intranet. So we have firewall, which helps to restrict access so that people who are not supposed to be part of the group or who do not work in the organization cannot have access to the intranets. So the intranet facilitates internal communication. Then we go, we move on to the third, the third topology. As I lecture, please jot down your questions. If you have any question, you jot it down. When I finish the two, when I finish the two, because of network breakage, et cetera, I want to hurry up and do all the two. When we finish and we are still online, then I'll ask you to ask questions. If we happen to be offline before we finish, then when we meet in person, you, you can ask your questions. So the intranet, sorry. Yeah, we, we are done with the intranet. Now we move on to the third topology which is the astronaut, the astronaut. Now the astronauts operate differently a bit. It operates differently from the internet. We've seen that the internet, you see the internet, inter means global access. Everybody can have access, that is internet. The intranet means inter-organizational, which means some group of some defined group of people only has access. And then the extra, the extranet, what the extranet does is that it is actually a designed or it helps, it provides some kind of linkage or it facilitates communication between the organization on one side and People outside the organization on the other side, uh, not, not people outside the organization. Let me come again. If I, if I put it like that, you may be confused. Now, what the extranet means or how, uh, how it works is that it facilitates communication between the organization on one side and some defined group of people outside the organization on the other side. I hope this one is better. Communication between the organization on one side and some defined, defined group of people outside the organization on the other side. You, you, you get it. So here, you would notice that with the astronaut, there is communication between the organization and some people outside the organization. But this time, this time, it is not just anybody outside the organization who can be part of the communication system. We have some defined group of people. If you leave your microphone, or muted, I will take you off. I have taken some of your colleagues off. I have taken some of them off. I, I, this time I will not talk. If once you leave your microphone unmuted, I will just take you off. I'll remove you and you cannot join again. So I was saying that the extranet allows communication between the organization and some defined group of people who are outside the organization. This time it is like the internet where we can have communication between the organization and everybody outside the organization or the intranet where we can have communication within the organization but it is rather communication between the organization and some defined group of people outside the organization and the defined group of people can be the customers, the companies or the institutions, customers or suppliers. Or it's normally you.
Madam, please, your microphone is muted and we can't hear. Oh, wow. Oh, my people, sorry. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, ma yes madam. All right, so then let me go back because yes, I, I actually finished um, talking about astronaut. So I, I'm sure you heard it up to the point I defined astronaut. Is that correct? Yes, madam. All right. So I made mention of the fact that the internet is very unstable. I keep on going off and on. So you have to bear with me. Let's see how far we go with it. Now, I said that the extranet, unlike the internet and the intranet, the extranet allows for communication between the organization on one side and some group of people, some defined group of people outside the organization. And the defined group of people outside the organization can be the organization's customers, their suppliers, their business partners, et cetera, et cetera. What is important here is that the people who are at the other end of the communication should be outside the organization and they should be defined. It is if, if you leave the people undefined, then it becomes the internet. Because you have communication between the organization and the people outside the organization. That is everybody outside the organization. But that is not how the extranet functions. With the extranet, the people outside the organization who are part of the communication happen to be some defined group of people. So if it is the company's um, um, customers or suppliers or partners, then only those people can have access to the system. I gave example of Astronet as EDI. EDI. I made mention of EDI as the main system that facilitated electronic commerce before the birth of the internet. So with EDI, the organization can actually communicate with its customers. If you don't mute your microphone, I'll take you off. Dockers. Mute the microphone before I take you off. Okay, so um, EDI actually facilitated communication between the organization and the people outside the organization. For instance, if a customer, uh, how, uh, the, the extranet is actually, or uh, it allows for, for instance, order, et cetera, or communication between the organization and its partners. So for instance, if I'm a customer of, Let's say um, a particular shop. Let's use let's, let's use uh, my business. That's clothing, right? If I have an extranet with my customers, then it means that this system it will allow my customers who want to place order for my clothing to go onto their laptops. Th this is like a software, and eh? so they will log into the software, then place an order of clothing, and the order they will pl they will place. Once they send it to me, I will get it direct and know how much goods they want to buy or clothing they want to buy. So that is how the extranet works. It is not like the internet where everybody has access. This time, we have some limited group of people who have been given access. That is why I said that the extranet facilitates communication between the organization and some defined group of people outside the organization. Now we have, um, I have, I have, um, I have summarized, I have summarized all the three topologies in a table form, in a table form. So we have the topology, which is the internet, intranet, extranet. Then we have the uh, extent and the focal. So for instance, if you look at internet topology, the extent of the internet topology is, is, is the fact that it is global. That is, everybody can have access. And the focus is normally for stakeholder relationship. Stakeholder relationship. It, it, it goes, I mean, everybody's stakeholder, all of us are stakeholders. So everybody is a part of the internet communication system. Then we have the intranet. The extent of the intranet is organizational. Organizational. 
And the focus is that only employees can have access. So employee information and communication. It allows empl employees information and communication. Then we have the extranet. The extent of the extranet is for business partnerships. And then the focus is distribution channel. That's why I gave the example of, for instance, if you want to place an order and you happen to be a customer of a particular organization and you are on their extranet, you, you have the system that you can go to to place your order and they will have your order. You can make payments with electronic payment system. Then they will ship your goods to you. So that is how it works. If you have any questions, note them down. I'm going to move on to security. When I'm done with security of electronic transaction, then I'll take questions on the two. That's the electronic commerce topology and security of e-transactions. So just note down your questions. I'll come back and give you the opportunity to ask. Now let's move on to security of electronic transactions. When I am done with this lecture, I will upload the video onto my YouTube channel so that I'll send you the link. You can go there and download and listen again in case you didn't get anything. Or for those who couldn't make it today, you can tell them to go there and download the video. I cannot send the video by WhatsApp to you because the length is long and WhatsApp cannot take longer uh, uh, videos. So, uh, I mean, the only uh, I cannot also upload it onto the LMS. The LMS, it is only up to five megabytes. Videos with only size of five megabytes can be put there. But this one, you can have like maybe, uh, God knows, to more than 200 megabytes or uh, really, I don't really know, but it will be more. So the only place will be my YouTube channel. You can go there and download. When you go there, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. All right, so security of electronic transactions. Now, security is a very, very important topic. In fact, when we are dealing with electronic, banking or digital banking or electronic business or electronic commerce, security is key. Security is key. You know, with this um, type of businesses or type of transactions I made mention of, normally we use any of the three topologies the internet, the intranet, and the extranet. And you can be exposed, especially when you are on the internet and your system is not well secured. So security happens to be an eternal concern for organizations because once they happen to operate online, data protection is something that becomes key. But if you don't secure your customer's data very well, if you look at section 85 of the Banking Act 2004, Act 673, if you go through section 85, it has clearly been stated that banks have the responsibility or obligation to keep their customers' information secrets. Secrets. Meaning that if a bank does not keep its customers' information secret due to their negligence or lack of well-secured protection for the client's information, then they'll be brought to book. They'll face the punishment stated under the law. So security is not just, you know, for security or protection reason, but also to adhere to the requirements of the law. Now, sensitive data is something that organizations deal with all the time. And because of that, they must protect their uh, customers or their information in general. If you look at a bank, for instance, you have customers, electronic card numbers, customers account numbers, customers pin numbers, 
customers' passwords, customers' blah, 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 a whole lot of information. So if there are no security systems in place, and unauthorized people who have, or people, hackers, for instance, are able to get unauthorized access to this information, they will use the information against the client, and the clients can also sue the bank for negligence. And I have already told you under section 85 of the Banking Act, banks have the responsibility of protecting their client's information secret. So if they fail to do that, then the punishment that goes with failure to adhere to the requirements of the law will be given to them. Now, security does not always mean you need a higher form of protection. Now, you know security um, is quite expensive, especially if you are dealing with organizations, bigger, bigger organizations, banks, etc. They invest heavily in security systems, various types of security systems. And the customers too, they need some form of protection. You and I, we also need some form of protection to secure ourselves. It is very, very important we do that before hackers can hack into the system. UPSA as a big institution, UPSA I know invests a lot on security, but I don't know if you heard of some years ago or some time ago, there was a rumor that some people were able to hack into UPSA system and they changed results and a whole lot of things and UPSA later called back the certificates of those people who did all that. So now those people, some of them had completed school. Some were in level 400 or so. Those in, in school were redrawn. Those who had completed the university, their certificates were redrawn. So they are like people who have not gone to university before. Imagine. So we all need some form of security for electronic transactions, et cetera. And in this class, I'm going to take you through three basic security mechanisms. These mechanisms are the systems that the uh, uh, highly sophisticated security systems have been built on. They are also the same systems that we can also use to at least give some form of first aid security protection to our data or online transactions. So we are going to look at three main uh, security systems, basic ones. The first one, the first one is what we call access control. The slides are not showing. Oh, okay. Let me see. Can you see the slides now? Yes, madam. Okay. Sorry, eh? and thank you. The, the person who alerted me, thank you very much. You're so, welcome. Oh, yeah, thank you. So I was saying that um, the, we are going to look at three main um, forms of security. That's the basic ones that we can all use to protect our online transactions. The first one we'll be looking at is access control. The second one will be encryption or coding. And then the third one will be firewall, firewall, firewall. We'll follow the sequence like I've mentioned, it can be any of them, but we'll begin with access control, access control. Now, access control happened to be one of the basic system of security that everybody can use. I mean, it is something that everybody can use to protect his or her electronic transactions. Bigger companies and institutions do use access control to protect their clients' information as well. Now, the access control uh, security mechanism actually comes in the form of authentication mechanisms. They come in the form of authentication mechanisms. And the form of authentication mechanisms includes, for instance, password, uh, um, password, PIN numbers, uh, biometric, uh, thumbprinting, 
etc etc those things that you need to key in before you can have access to certain uh, information on the internet or to certain parts or, or items on the internet i mean once you are online you need to use some form of access control before you can have access to the particular information in question and we have examples i have given some examples account numbers password ip address etc but i have a more elaborative examples here i've tabulized them some of the authentication mechanisms we have the class and the example in terms of those mechanisms which require personal memory, that is those authentication mechanisms that you need to commute in your head. You need to keep them in memory. Examples include your name, your account number, your password. For instance, if you call in for internet banking, that is if you call, sorry, if you call in for telephone banking, for instance, the first thing that the customer service personnel at the other end will ask is for you to show that you are the customer in question. So he may request for your name, your full name, your date of birth, your account number, a particular password, blah, 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 blah. If you are doing internet banking or your mobile banking, some of the authentication mechanisms that will be required is for you to key in your password, your password. So if you don't know your password or PIN, there's no way you can have access to your account. You see, so these are some of the examples that has to do with the class of authentication mechanisms that requires personal memory. That is for you to keep them in your head. Your head, your PIN numbers, like your ATM PIN, etc. You are not supposed to share some of these personal memory class of authentication mechanism they are meant for only you you don't store them in any other place if you store them on your phone people if somebody steals your phone the person can have access so if the person happens to steal your phone together with your atm card and you have stored your atm pin on your phone book the person just goes through the phone book sees your pin use it to withdraw money from your account so you don't do that then we have the class of authentication mechanism that involves some form of objects. Objects. Examples include badge, plastic card, key, IP address. For instance, if in, in the organization, for instance, there are some places that if you before you can go to, you need to uh, you know plus in your card or something before you be allowed access, or your key. If somebody, um, uh, or maybe IP address, without the IP address, you know, there's no way you can go to your organization's website or in uh, your email, even your inbox. Without your uh, IP address, you cannot go to the website to even access your account and all that. Then we have some authentication mechanisms, which also require some personal characteristics. This one, we are talking about the biometrics. Example, your fingerprints, your voice print, your signature. You know, voice print is used for telephone banking. I told you that, that is, uh, we have a, a particular system which recognizes every individual as having a unique voice. So once your voice is programmed to your telephone banking and you call in, as soon as you call in, the device is able to authenticate your voice. You know that you are the actual owner. It doesn't matter whether you've lost your voice, etc. The system will be able to detect that you are actually the person. Signature, hand size, etc. So all these now we have some, not in our parts of the world, but in the advanced countries, we have ATMs that require fingerprints and all that. I don't know if we have some in Ghana here. Anyway, so that is authentication mechanism. The first basic form of security that we can all use. Then we come to the second one, firewall. Firewall, just like the name goes, the wall with fire. So firewall is like having a wall, right? Which is surrounded by fire. And then this wall is placed in between the organization and the outside world. 
And the main function of the firewall is that it directs traffic. That is, all information leaving the organization will pass through the firewall. All information from the outside world to the organization will also pass through the firewall. When it passes through the firewall, then firewall will determine which ones are authorized and let them gain access and which ones are not authorized and then block the access. So if somebody is trying to hack into your system and there's firewall in place, then it means that the firewall will block the person who, who wants to have the unauthorized access. So I just used, just like the name goes, firewall as an illustration. It doesn't mean that there's a wall with firewall, my people. Don't go and misquote me anywhere. It is just a, 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 a scenario I tried creating for you to understand. But then it is a system. It is a security system. But it functions like I just mentioned, that it, it's like a, having a firewall placed in between the organization and the people outside the organization. So every information that leaves the organization passes through this system called firewall. And then every information that moves from outside the organization to the organization also passes through this system called firewall. So it is now the duty of the firewall to determine which ones are authorized and must be allowed access into the organization or from the organization to the outside world. So in the wisdom of this system, if the information is not authorized, there's no way the system will allow it to come to the organization or leave the organization. Now, it used to be the, the olden type of laptops, we, they used to have firewall at the status bar beneath the screen that you could see the firewall. The first types of laptops made, I mean, in, in the around the mid 2000s, et cetera, those uh, olden type of laptops, we had something like that there. So you could see your firewall there. Then you can turn it on or you can turn it off. Now you have to go through this, uh, is it the settings, security before you can detect firewall. But it used to be visible. But once your laptop, for instance, once your firewall is on, then it means that you have some form of security. Nobody will be allowed or will, will have the access to your personal information. But my people, irrespective of all these things you are saying, when a hacker tells you that he will hack, they can still penetrate. You know, the concept of hacking, I, I admire hackers a lot. I admire them a lot. The concept of hacking is that, you know, just like a, every house has a front door and a back door, right? Every software or system has a front door and a back door. So when you are protecting your system, now, you know, normally we pay more attention to the front door because we tend to believe that when there's any attack, it will come from the front door. And sometimes we forget the back door. So what the hackers do is that they always look for the back door or they go through the back door into the system because most organizations are not concerned about their back doors. This is just a scenario I've created for you to understand how the hackers, how their system works. So firewall, once it is in place, it blocks access, but you know, uh, hackers are unpredictable. This, this guy, there was an incident that happened in, in the New York Stock Exchange some time ago, some years ago. This guy sat in his, in his home in Heathrow, UK, with his laptop, and he was able to hack the New York Stock Exchange. He created fake orders and created a scenario as if everybody was, you know, selling their shares. And you know, in the security market, when shares are being sold, when people start selling their shares, then there's an impression that maybe something is wrong. So everybody will also start shelling, uh, selling in order not to lose. So when this happens, or when this happens, it actually reduces the price of the particular security or securities involved. So this guy created this scenario and securities fell. Then he, he was able to, you know, purchase a lot of securities 
then he created, he created a scenario that the securities were also being bought. So he sold the securities at a very high price. He made millions of dollars profits. The New York, uh, sorry, the U.S. security never understood what happened because they thought they had the best of security system in place. Uh, of course, the New York Stock Exchange is the number one stock exchange in the world. It's the best stock exchange in the world in terms of market capitalization. And if a whole New York Stock Exchange can be hacked, you can imagine. It took them years, it took them years before they were able to detect that. And who even did that was in Heathrow, UK. Heathrow. When they caught the guy, eh, they, want, they asked him how he did it. They thought they had the best security systems in place. They asked him how he did it. But as at the time I was following the story on BBC, the guy never spoke a word. You can imagine. So security is a matter of, you know, great concern to organizations. Because once your system is open, you'll be in deep trouble. You'll be in very big trouble. Okay. So that is firewall. Actually, firewall is what is used to block access uh, for of people who are not part of the intranet of an organization. Firewall blocks the access so that they won't have access to the organization's internal communication system. All right, so we move on to encryption and coding. Now, with coding, you know, especially in the security system, normally they have some codes they use. Their codes, uh, you know, everybody, a, a group of people can have some sort of codes that are known to only them and they understand. So if, um, um, for instance, the code can be in numbers or it can be in words or et cetera. So I remember, uh, um, I, at the law school, one of our lecturers was sharing a story about uh, him going to court. He met one of his uh, old students. I mean, no, they went, they went for a program or something. He presented a paper and then he met one of his old students. And he, uh, I mean, two of his old students. And one of them came to him. The other was not able to come to him. The one who went to him said, told him that, oh, sir, uh, I'm so sorry that this other guy couldn't come here because he came with his laptop. Because he came with his laptop. He said that uh, he thought that maybe because he was coming to present, so his laptop means his laptop for presentation. Not knowing the laptop is a different thing altogether. The laptop means that he came with his girlfriend. The girlfriend happens to be the laptop while the wife is a desktop at home. So you can, that's an example of coding a message. You, you get it? So if you, if, if you see somebody and you, you say that, oh, I'm here with my laptop, and the person who, is, who does not understand what you mean by the laptop, there's no way the person will get the meaning of the information you just put across. So coding and encryption is actually uh, to help, you know, change the meaning or protect the meaning of data. So that even if unauthorized persons are able to intercept the message when sent, they will not understand a thing. You get it? They won't understand. You need to be part of the group of people who use the codes or the coded message to be able to understand. And for encryption, you need to have the key to be able to unlock the meaning, unlock the message before you can have the message as it is intended. So once you don't have the key and you come across the information, it will look, um, you know, some form of uh, gobble the go to you, gobble the go to you. But to the person who has the key, then it will look, you know, meaningful because he will be able to decide, uh, uh, unlock the message and get the full meaning of the message. Now, with encryption, there's this um, uh, um, picture here that I want to use to illustrate to you. 
we have the sender. When you are sending a message and you don't want the message to be, I, I mean, you don't want any other person to be able to understand the message as it is intended in case that person intercepts the message, especially hackers, in case they intercept the message and you don't want them to understand, then you, the sender, you have to encrypt or lock the message. You lock it with your uh, with, with a key. And this key, you will give it to the sender, sorry, the recipient. So when the recipient receives the message, he or she will unlock or decrypt the message with that key to be able to get the full meaning as intended. For instance, if you want to send a message, I'm looking for an example. Okay. For instance, if I want to send this message to George, or let's say Rick, let's use the example we have here. Rick is sending this message to George and the content is an email actually. The subject of the mail is message, uh, sorry, money. Then Rick, the message from Rick is that it begins with greetings. Good day, George. I hope you are enjoying your stay in Switzerland. Could you do me a favor? I need 50,000 US dollars from my secret Swiss bank account. The name of the bank is Aussie Saucy International in Geneva. The account code is 4513329. And the password is Mikathera. I'll see you and the money at the airport this Friday. Cheers, Rick. Just imagine if such a message is being sent across. Look at the content of the message. Very, very sensitive. This person has provided his account number, his password. When this information lands in wrong hands, that is, if a hacker is able to intercept this message, he will be able to use the account number and the password to withdraw from uh, Rick's account. You see? So if you are sending such a message, in the first place, you are not supposed to send such messages across the internet. In the first place, don't send such messages across the internet. But should you send such messages across the internet, that is such sensitive messages across the internet, then you need to encrypt it. You need to encrypt it. You lock the message. So once you lock or encrypt the message, the message, if it is intercepted by any other person apart from George, you know, what Rick did was that Rick decrypted, uh, sorry, encrypted the message and gave the key to George. So when George received the message, George will use the key given to him by Rick to unlock the message. Once George uh, key in the code or the password or whatever is that what we call the key. Once he key in, he'll be able to get the message as intended. But if anybody else apart from George intercepts this message, this is how the message will look like. It will look meaningless. I mean, you only see numbers and letters. You don't see any meaning or you cannot make any meaning from what is here. So that is the benefit of encryption. When you encrypt a message and anybody else apart from the recipient intercepts it, the message will look meaningless to the person and your sensitive information will not be used against you. So my people, this morning we have talked about three topologies of electronic transactions that is the internet, which we saw as facilitating global communication, the internet, which facilitates internal communication, the extranet, which facilitates communication between the organization and some defined group of people outside the organization. Then we came to security of electronic transactions, and we saw that we had three main basic forms of security. That is the 
access control, which gives you know, remote access or first aid access of data protection. We have the firewall, which helps block unauthorized access of people or direct traffic from the organization and the outside world. And then the encryption or coding, which actually changes the meaning of a message to be meaningless when it is intercepted by unauthorized personnel. So these are the things we have looked at this morning. If you have any question, you can ask. I rest my case, so ask your questions. You can raise your hand, I'll call you, if you have questions. Any questions, my people? If there are no questions to you, let me know so that I can live peacefully. You can also live peacefully. But remember the video, I'll send you the link. Today, I'll give you, by this evening, I'll send you the link. Then you can go to my YouTube channel to download and re-listen to the lecture. So do I take your silence to mean you have understood everything I have talked of this morning? I've not slept to my people. Yes, my dad. All right. So once you understand, that is good. It means the purpose has been achieved. Now I'll leave you with a quote that there's no elevator to success, my people. You have to take the stairs. Don't think that there are shortcuts to success. If you follow shortcuts to success, it will land you, it will land you in eternal misery and suffering. So always take the stairs, the normal route to success. And the normal route to success is hard work. I wish you all the best. I'll see you next week in person. That is as of now in person, but I don't know what will come up. As for the weekend, I have my own arrangements with you. So yours is a different thing. But for evening and regular, we'll meet in person. And then if anything should come up, I'll let you know. I wish you all the best. Enjoy the holidays and your weekend. Until we meet again, it is bye-bye from me, my people. God bless you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.